thank you, uh, Usha and uh, Nitin, my great collaborators. Uh, sorry, I'm not from Coimbatore. Uh, I am basically from Kerala, but I did my postgraduate training oh. in Coimbatore Medical College. You studied in Coimbatore. That's where I heard the word. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> so welcome back to Tamil Nadu anyways. Yeah, we'll claim one, you as our own. Yeah, and one of my trainee, uh, Lilavati Kandasamy, is uh, known to you. Uh, uh, she's uh, currently practicing in Tamil Nadu. It's a great pleasure to meet you all uh, again today. Um, I'll be just uh, trying to share my screen one second. So today I'll be talking about uh, a typical uh, diabetes. So it's just like uh, trying to approach different forms of diabetes. Uh, I'm not trying to complicate uh, the lecture by giving a lot of unusual, rare kind of uh, diabetes I'm trying. Okay, I think that's full screen. Is that okay? Right, okay. okay. Um, so it's basically an approach to different uh, forms of diabetes in your uh, usual clinical practice. As clinicians, we all deal with a different uh, types of diabetes uh, and problems uh, uh, related to their management. And it's uh, slightly tricky to approach some of the cases. Uh, so this is uh, the theme of my talk today. Uh, this is my competing interest statement. I have received a research grant for my diabetes nursing colleagues uh, from Menarini Pharmaceuticals. And we are in the process of uh, uh, a, a randomized controlled trial with the trisopatide with LLA. Uh, but I don't have any direct conflicts of uh, interest uh, related to the uh, talk today. What I am trying to do today to give a brief introduction about how we approach different types of uh, diabetes uh, in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. Uh, and then I will uh, show uh, five different type of uh, case scenarios uh, with a uh, few MCQs and the audience have a, a chance to do real-time voting. I hope uh, the, uh, the admin staff will be able to help me with that uh, when we present the, the questions. And we can have a brief discussion, maybe five to 10 minutes discussion after the talk. Uh, the talk will be overall for around uh, 35 minutes. And then uh, we'll have a chance to discuss. And uh, I would like to take uh, uh, points Sorry from. Sorry to interrupt. Thinking. Yeah. Sorry to. Um, RX events, you posted the link for the quiz right at the top at the beginning of this, but it's migrated way to the top. Can you please repost it for everyone right now so that oh, we have the oh, link yes, for the will. quiz oh, yes, visible? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Beg your pardon. Back to you. So, should I do anything or. Uh... Nope, the link has been reposted just now so that it's accessible to everyone who's just oh, joined. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right, okay. So the case scenarios uh, and then a brief discussion, okay? Right. Introduction to the topic. Um, this is based on one of our recent publications, I think. Uh, uh, Nitin's uh, former trainee uh, helped me to do this work, uh, Dr. Jiaudin from Scotland. So individualized diabetes care, uh, the lessons we all learn uh, in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, uh, that's what I'm trying to share in today's talk. Until the uh, end of uh, 20th century, we only had limited options for management of uh, different forms of diabetes. For type one, we had a, a few insulin molecules uh, to manage uh, uh, diabetes. And for type 2, we had only a uh, few uh, oral hypoglycemic agents. But in the turn of the 21st century, or the past couple of decades, there had been a boom of uh, new multiple molecules uh, uh, for care of uh, diabetes. Uh, and that changed the scenario of uh, diabetes care in our day-to-day -day clinical practice very widely. So now we have uh, different... Uh, technologies uh, for glucose monitoring, like continuous glucose monitoring, uh, different uh, insulin molecules, newer molecules, uh, insulin pump systems uh, with uh, artificial pancreas. And I hope uh, in near future, we'll be able to even cure uh, type 1 diabetes. In fact, I'm currently doing a, a journal issue for Frontiers uh, with my American colleagues uh, to look at uh, the, the curative aspects of uh, type 1 diabetes. So, Technology has improved so much in the 21st century. 
And if you look at type 2 diabetes, we have a lot of new molecules, uh, such as uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, and newer molecule uh, triagonists and biagonists. So all those things uh, help us to manage diabetes much better than uh, in, the, in the past. So we now uh, talk about reversing type 1 diabetes and uh, type 2 diabetes. So in the near future, we may have a potential cure. But unfortunately, diabetes is the only condition largely managed by patients. And the clinician's role is to support the patient's self-management. So that's why we have to individualize diabetes care for each patient uh, with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, because uh, this is the only condition they manage, and the physician support is mainly to empower them. So that's a highly individualized uh, approach to diabetes management. That's what the theme of uh, the discussion today with the case scenarios. Going to the first case scenario, uh, this is a story of a 67-year-old uh, woman with a six-year history of type 2 diabetes, managed with glipicide 10 milligrams daily, uh, twice daily, because uh, she was intolerant to metformin. Her average fasting glucose readings uh, were somewhere around 160 milligrams per deciliter, and she recently gained uh, weight around 7 kilograms. So, her ultrasound scan shows steatosis. Uh, she also has uh, hypertension and uh, dyslipidemia, presumably controlled in the past. There was no known complications uh, of uh, diabetes mellitus, but looking at her uh, clinical profile, she has high BMI, uh, inadequately controlled hypertension, and she has fasting hyperglycemia with an HbA1c of 70 uh, millimoles per uh, mole uh, in our, our uh, unit, but in the uh, Indian uh, units, it's 8.6 percentage. She still has deranged lipid profile and deranged liver functions, uh, showing some probable steatohepatitis uh, going on. And her kidney function is not adequate. Uh, her EGFR was only 38 milliliters uh, per minute, uh, with high uh, albumin creatinine ratio and stage two uh, uh, liver steatosis. Based on this case scenario, uh, she was asking uh, if she can be on an SGLT2 inhibitor, as she here, it will help weight loss and probably protect the heart. So my first question for the audience will be, in this context, what is the main limitation of an SGLT2 inhibitor, empagliflozin? You can vote now. Unfortunately, for some reasons, uh, I can't see the whole uh, percentage and kind of things which I was suspecting, but that's fine. So I'm going to the answer. Right? Uh, D is the correct answer. Of course, uh, there will be some weight loss, which may be persistent. Uh, in fact, uh, these medications help uh, patients with steatosis. And it will improve uh, proteinuria. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, there may be a transient uh, reduction in GFR, but it will pick up later. So it will not sufficiently control her uh, uh, hyperglycemia because uh, with renal dysfunction, there can be reduction of uh, uh, the improvement of uh, hyperglycemia with SGLT2 inhibitors. Her EGFR was only 38. So therefore, we don't expect a good improvement of HbA1c to the target of less than 8% or ideally less than 7.5%. We have a variety of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in the market now, uh, but we mostly use uh, three uh, molecules uh, here in the UK and most of the Europe and Americas. Uh, Empagliflozin, uh, you can start with 10 milligram and increase the dose to 25 milligrams later. Dapagliflozin, 
uh, and canagliflozin. Most of these medications are used once daily and ideally taken in the morning uh, because uh, they will uh, cause some diuresis and uh, patient will have to uh, wake up overnight if you take it in the evening, right? Uh, the major side effects are uh, pentidiasis. Of course, some patients may get uh, UTI, and I always advise my patient to take plenty of fluids to hydrate them, except uh, in situations where they have fluid overload, and uh, ensure that they clean the genitalia with water uh, every time they pass urine to prevent glucose sticking onto the uh, genitalia to cause candidiasis. Diabetes ketosis is a, a non-serious complication, but uh, fortunately, uh, only uh, small numbers of patients, uh, but you have to probably counsel the patient appropriately. We can discuss that later. Uh, this is our real-world data on using different SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, we have around 467 patients we published it recently with significant improvement of uh, uh, the, the patient's uh, HbA1c uh, at six months period and subsequently uh, further improvement with some of the molecules with some uh, worsening of the diabetes control uh, with uh, dapagliflozin or uh, empagliflozin later. This is the weight management data, which is probably better than the real world uh, uh, clinical trial based data because clinical trials show around maybe two to four kilograms body weight loss, but we, uh, we found around four to 10 kilograms body weight loss with uh, different molecules, especially with the dapagliflozin and canagliflozin. Uh, there was a tendency towards uh, weight gain with the empagliflozin, but the, you can see only a small number was uh, in the empagliflozin group. We found improvement of uh, uh, albuminuria, uh, most significantly with the canagliflozin, but this is only based on around 100 patients who had meaningful results. So it seems uh, SDL T2 inhibitors are very important for our day-to-day -day management of uh, uh, diabetes. Of course, it's more costly. You have to appropriately choose the patient. It causes weight loss because uh, it uh, causes increased uh, glucagon to insulin ratio, resulting in lipolysis, uh, helping weight loss. It causes glycosuria and natiuresis uh, and free water excretion, improving the uh, cardiac ejection fraction and uh, possibly renal function. Uh, and uh, all these factors will help weight loss. So this is a group of medication we have to consider in the appropriate clinical context. That's the uh, take home uh, with this particular case scenario. You have to always consider uh, lifestyle modifications with uh, uh, any patients with the diabetes when you manage them, as uh, it will reduce the risk uh, of incident diabetes, as we see uh, from the from the uh, diabetes prevention program. But uh, any patients with uh, type two or type two uh, type one diabetes should have appropriate lifestyle changes to improve uh, their diabetes management. All right, I'll go on to the next case. Uh, this is the story of a 42-year-old man who presented uh, to the diabetes clinic after recent hospitalization with hyperglycemia and diabetes ketosis doses three months ago. His uh, glucose control was quite poor. Uh, the first uh, episode of uh, uh, decay, and that was the time when he had the initial diagnosis of diabetes, uh, and he had uh, hyperglycemia with uh, high HbA1c. He was treated initially with insulin infusion for ketoacidosis, and he was subsequently discharged uh, three days later on uh, Lantus insulin, the Glargin, 20 units at night, and metformin one gram twice daily. But when he came back to the clinic three months later, he has been developing hypoglycemia in the morning. So did not have significant post medical history. He has a family history uh, of type 2 diabetes in his father at the age of 65 years. And examination was uh, showing a slightly raised BMI of 26 kilograms per meter squared. But for our Indian standards, uh, it can be obesity. So my question to the audience uh, will be, uh, which of the following measurements uh, you will do uh, for this particular patient uh, to have a clear diagnosis and to plan about the long-term insulin management?
right? I hope uh, the audience could poll, but I can't see that maybe in the faculty link. So the correct answer is, one second, just try to move forward. Uh, answer B, basically the patient uh, uh, in this particular scenario has uh, a ketosis prone diabetes. Uh, the first episode itself was with ketoacidosis uh, uh, in the diagnosis of type two diabetes. The patient has high uh, C-peptide uh, indicating that patient has a preserved uh, beta cell function and the uh, anti-GAD antibodies and uh, IA2 antibodies were negative. So implying that this is uh, not uh, type 1 diabetes. Although he presented with the DKA, uh, he may be controlled well with uh, oral hypoglycemic agents in the long run and we can gradually wean off his uh, uh, insulin uh, to maintain him on uh, oral hypoglycemic agents. We have to bear in mind that about one third of new onset of uh, DKA uh, in type 2 diabetes may be related to ketosis prone diabetes. So you have to consider testing C peptide in such situations to ensure that they don't have uh, type 1 diabetes, where the, the uh, C peptide level will be quite low, less than 200 nanomoles per liter. Whereas uh, those with the preserved beta cell function, you can expect uh, a high C peptide level more than. Uh, 300 nanomoles per uh, liter. All right, that's the second case. Um, I think we can have discussion uh, after the talk. Uh, so I'm going to the third case. This is a story of a 58-year-old woman with a 10-year history of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Managed with metformin 1 gram twice daily, glycoside 160 milligram twice daily, and insulin glargin uh, 60 units at night. She was referred to the diabetes clinic because uh, her glycemic control was getting uh, inadequate. Uh, and then uh, she needed specialist input to consider uh, additional treatment or uh, expert input. Uh, physical examination revealed high BMI, 41 kilograms per meter squared, and uh, hypertension. Her HbA1c was still high, 9.1%. Uh, uh, with deranged lipids and uh, liver functions, uh, suggest your probable uh, steatosis, which is quite common uh, in patients uh, with type 2 diabetes. Renal functions, thyroid, uh, uh, urine tests were all normal. So going on to the question, adding which class of anti-diabetic agent would be the best suitable choice for this patient's comorbidities? because I can't uh, see the uh, real-time voting <laughs> in my screen. Uh, so I just uh, wait for a few seconds and then uh, go to the answers. Right, the answer is B. Uh, it's ideal to add a GLP-1 agonist. I know it's uh, quite costly in, in the Indian uh, context, but possibly uh, if a uh, uh, patient is not affordable to use a GLP-1 agonist, you can try a DPP-4 inhibitor at least. Right? Uh, why GLP-1 receptor agonist? Because patient has uh, significant uh, uh, obesity, and unless you target a medical therapy which helps her diabetes with obesity, the so-called terminology diabetes, uh, we won't succeed in managing her. Uh, the best molecule we use here currently is semaglutide. Of course, the new molecules, uh, uh, precipitate also is approved now for use uh, in the NHS and uh, I've started using the medication. You can start with a small dose, uh, gradually stepping up the dose depending on the tolerance of the patient. And there comes the next question. What are the possible side effects from these molecules? I think most of the audience might have had the answer already because it's a relatively simple question. So it's nausea and vomiting. Of course, uh, there were signals uh, regarding medullary carcinoma of thyroid in animal models, but uh, 
nothing from the human studies. Pancreatitis was an anticipated risk in the past. Uh, there was a label from uh, FDA and other agencies, but uh, multiple meta-analysis did not suggest a significantly high risk. And of course, pancreatitis can be part of obesity as such. Uh, in fact, these patients uh, will get protection from heart failure to a great extent. So the, the, the uh, common side effect is uh, nausea and uh, vomiting. Of course, uh, you can have hypoglycemia when combined with sulfonylureas and insulin. So you have to be careful. You have to titrate the dose uh, depending on the uh, effect. So GI discomfort is uh, not uncommon, and uh, some patients you may even may get uh, a pseudo obstruction kind of picture and significant nausea and vomiting, which may uh, stop, uh, which may uh, uh, prevent them from using the molecule uh, for long. Uh, you have to take precaution in patients with worsening retinopathy because marked change in the uh, glycemic control, improvement of glycemic control may worsen retinopathy in such patients. And in those with heart failure and pancreatitis, you may avoid this medication. Right? Uh, so the advantage being significant weight reduction, HbO1c improvement at par with uh, even insulin with some of the molecules, good suppression of appetite and better cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, the sustained 1 to 11 trials showed the benefit of uh, uh, semaglutide, uh, which improves HbO1c uh, by a, a factor of 1.5 percentage points. And the, the, the step 1 to 8 trials showed that semaglutide is really useful for obesity with an average weight loss of 14.9 percentage uh, in the uh, patients using 2.4 milligrams per week in a 68-week uh, follow-up period. In fact, we are dealing with diabetes in such patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes. Uh, as you know, uh, the adipocyte injury from abdominal adiposity uh, results in release of a lot of uh, chemical factors, which causes a, a low-grade systemic inflammation, increasing insulin resistance. There may be a change in the uh, adiponectin secretion, and adverse lifestyle uh, adds on to the insulin resistance causing diabetes. Of course, there's a lot of research uh, coming up uh, in the gut microbiome profile uh, in controlling diversity, and it is one of the PhD research project of my training uh, uh, to look at gut microbiome signature before and after intervention with the different uh, 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 modalities of treatment of diversity. Uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, reduced appetite uh, by its effect on the uh, central mechanisms in the hypothalamus. It uh, reduced uh, gastric emptying and therefore uh, helped the patient to reduce the portion size. It has pancreatic uh, trophic actions, uh, reducing the uh, glucagon uh, release and uh, improving the endogenous insulin production. All these factors reduce hepatic gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, improving uh, glycemic outcomes and uh, diversity management. Uh, we have to go for a stepwise approach. As we all know, we have to change the lifestyle. If it doesn't work, we have to uh, use metformin uh, initially. And if it is not working well, you have to add on newer molecules like GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors in the right clinical context, always taking into consideration the patient's affordability as well. If these things do not work, revisit and try to intensify the regime. And of course, uh, in some situations, you have to refer the patient for bariatric surgery or bariatric procedures. And rare situations like uh, hypothalamic obesity and all, you have to use uh, newer molecules. This is our data based on 110 patients uh, on semaglutide, uh, which is published in the current issue of World Journal of Methodology. You can see 13.7% reduction in HbO1c from baseline uh, at uh, uh, six months, 12 months, and at the latest follow-up. There has been a problem with the availability of the molecule because of the global shortage in the recent past. And therefore, uh, uh, there can be some resurgence of uh, uh, worsening of uh, glycemic control. Significant number of patients could reduce the insulin doses, and we stopped insulin in several patients, and uh, we could even reverse diabetes in some of the patients. You can see significant weight reduction at par with the, the step trials 
So even with uh, one milligram of uh, semaglutide, there was a significant weight loss of about 12.3 percentage. So that's the third case. I'll quickly scan through a couple of additional cases and then we have a discussion. This is a story of a 67 year old woman who had been with high glucose readings in the past three days after starting treatment for asthma by her GP. Uh, she has been with reasonably good control uh, in the past, but because of her asthma exacerbation, the GP started her own uh, antibiotic prednisolone with a tapering course uh, uh, in a period of uh, 15 days. Right. Uh, she was feeling unwell uh, with uh, fatigue, polyuria, nocturia, uh, slightly higher glucose readings uh, and uh, high readings in the uh, late evening. Her HbO1 was well controlled in the recent past, one month ago, uh, and her uh, fasting glucose was reasonable. But what is causing her hyperglycemia? Because we need some additional data. I'll just go to the next slide. This is the pattern of her glycemic uh, fluctuations. You can see over the past three days, her glucose readings were go, going high, especially in the afternoon hours. What would be the cause of her uh, high readings in the afternoon? That's the question for this uh, scenario. Because of the time constraints, I'll go to the answer. Uh, this is a steroid treatment which was causing the problem because uh, she has been on prednisolone for her uh, asthma exacerbation, and that causes uh, worsening of her glucose towards the evening hours. And you have to be mindful that several of our patients, especially hospitalized patients, may be on treatment uh, with uh, steroids. Uh, in UK, up to 10% of patients in hospital may be on steroids. And we have to monitor those kind of patients, especially when they have diabetes or if they have a diabetes tendency. Uh, you can get uh, steroid-induced diabetes and steroid-induced uh, hyperglycemia in patients without diabetes and with diabetes. So you have to monitor them regularly, at least for a few days, uh, to ensure that their glucose control is adequate. And uh, you can uh, treat the patient uh, with a sulfonylurea if it's a new-onset diabetes or if patient is already uh, on insulin uh, or a patient uh, has inadequate control with sulfonylurea, you can uh, even use uh, an NPH insulin or a long-acting insulin. You may need to increase the baseline insulin dose up to 40% uh, with steroid use, and you have to consider weaning off once the patient is off the steroids within 24 hours the glucose tend to plummet and you have to cut down the ins uh, insulin doses or the uh, oral agents to avoid hyperglycemia. So this is a rough uh, guide to use uh, uh, insulin when patient is on steroid with the 10 milligram. You can use a long acting insulin, maybe 1.1 units per kilogram body weight daily uh, with the prednisolone dose in the morning. Uh, but it can be uh, a, a trial and error method, and uh, maximum dose we usually start is 0.4 units per kilogram body weight. If the duration of steroid treatment is longer, you probably need to uh, give uh, longer periods of uh, uh, higher dose of uh, hypoglycemic agents. The moral of the story, any patient with uh, new onset diabetes uh, without the classical picture of uh, type one or type two, you have to consider secondary diabetes including medication-induced diabetes, such as corticosteroid use, different endocrinopathies, such as acromegaly, Cushing syndrome, uh, even hyperthyroidism, fear chromocytoma, all those things can cause hyperglycemia and even frank diabetes. You have to consider pancreatic disorders in patients with the symptoms or severe hyperglycemia without any other major risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Various infections also can cause uh, this kind of uh, new onset diabetes in a, a typical patient. And iron storage disease has to be considered, especially if there's a family history. Right, I'm going on to the next case. This is a story of a 42 year old woman with history of the so-called type two diabetes in the past 12 years. 
she has strong family history of uh, diabetes in her uh, dad's side. She was initially tried on metformin, but because of diarrhea, she had to stop. And then subsequently, she was uh, uh, started on glycoside, which was causing severe hypoglycemia, and then stopped. Then she uh, was maintained on a small dose of uh, insulin, gradually escalating the dose to the current dose of 30 units in the morning and 42 units in the evening. So she has a 22-year-old son uh, who's also diagnosed recently with uh, uh, diabetes and he had hypoglycemia with the glycoside again. So her physical examination showed that she's uh, having a, a BMI of 26 kilograms per meter squared. She's a Caucasian, of course, uh, with normal blood pressure. Her glucose readings varied very widely with an HbA1c uh, in the uncontrolled range, 8.7%. Her LFTs, uh, blood profile, and urine ACR were all within normal range, and her uh, retinal profile was normal. What is the likely type of diabetes in her son? Because he developed uh, diabetes at the age of uh, 22 years without uh, the phenotypical picture of uh, classical type 2 with the history. That's the question. As I can't see the voting pattern, I'll just uh, go to the answer. This is probably a case of monogenic diabetes, right? So we discussed with the patient uh, the, the workup algorithm. She initially refused a genetic testing. Somehow she was not keen about the genetic testing. So we did a sulfonylurea challenge test, which shows drastic drop of her hyperglycemia in the morning. And then uh, she agreed to do the genetic testing, which was proven to be a uh, HNF1 alpha mutation, which was again positive in her son as well. So she's well managed with uh, glycoside, 40 milligrams twice daily with the latest HbA1c in the uh, appropriate range. So we have to consider monogenic diabetes uh, in young people, especially when they don't have the classical picture of type 1 or type 2. And, and those uh, children who develop diabetes within the first six months of uh, life and young adults and uh, uh, children uh, with a strong family history of uh, diabetes, at least in three generations, uh, you have to consider monogenic diabetes. Uh, we have recently developed uh, this algorithm uh, with one of uh, the Indian colleagues. Uh, if you have a strong suspicion of uh, Moody, you can do some simple testing uh, of fasting uh, plasma glucose HbA1c and an OGTT, and if OGTT doesn't show significant elevation, and if the glucose control is good, even without uh, medical therapy, and with a strong history of uh, GDM in the family, it may be a, a glucokinase moody, you can just uh, try to test it. If the fasting glucose profile uh, uh, is normal or increased with the large fluctuation of uh, glucose following an OGTT, uh, more than 90 milligrams per deciliter uh, and sensitivity to sulfonylureas. Uh, you have a couple of uh, probabilities. Uh, one is HNF4 alpha modi and HNF1 uh, 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 A modi uh, if uh, uh, the, the, the additional uh, investigations suggest this kind of presentation. So that comes to the end of my uh, presentation.